वबतु सहनो घुनक्तु सह वीर्यम करवा वहे तेजस्विनावधी तमस्तु माविद विषावहे ओम शांति 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 ही Oh, thank you very much. And uh, before I begin, I would also request uh, you to kindly uh, keep yourself on the mute during the course of the discussion, and uh, so that there is no uh, disturbance. So uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this very special uh, uh, edition of uh, our Vimarsh series of uh, lectures. Uh, today we have. Uh, uh instead of a lecture a book discussion and uh, today we'll be discussing the uh, recently published book uh it's been written by uh, general uh, nc wedge and the title of the book is uh, the kashmir conundrum the quest for peace uh, in a troubled land and uh, this book has already been uh, discussed and uh, released but i think uh, Uh, the topic is such that, uh, uh, and the book is written in uh, such a way that we'll be discussing this book for a long time to come because uh, this is uh, uh, a wonderful book to read, and uh, General Wedge uh, has uh, put in a lot of effort and uh, provided us a lot of insights into this uh, very uh, uh, difficult uh, issue that has been with us uh, for the last uh, several decades. uh genovich uh, requires uh, uh, no introduction uh, uh he is the former director of the vivekananda international foundation and uh, uh, he is also the member of our executive council and closely associated with uh, all our uh, activities uh many of his friends are here so you all know his uh, illustrious uh, career uh, in the uh, army he was the uh, uh chief of the army uh, uh he was also dgmo during the kargil war and he was uh, also the uh, vice chief of uh, the army uh he uh, is credited with the, the uh, decision to erect the smart fence on the line of control and that has prevented uh yeah, infiltration has been in preventing infiltration uh to a large extent uh, from the pakistani side uh he also uh, after retirement he also was the founder vice chairman of the uh, national disaster management authority and uh, during his tenure the ndma got its uh, shape and also uh, the direction he is playing a very important role today uh in uh, india's building india's resilience to deal with the, the disasters uh general wedge hails from uh, jammu and kashmir is also part of uh, the dogra regiment and he knows the affairs of the states so very intimately and uh, as you read the book uh, you see that uh, really what he writes is uh, coming from uh, the heart and also from the vast experience that he has had in uh, Uh, dealing with uh, uh, the very difficult security matters in the state, and he has done several tours of duty uh, in the state, like uh, other army officers. So, uh, thank you, General Wedge, for uh, being with us today, and we look forward to your discussion on your book. Uh, we also have two eminent uh, discussants. Uh, Ambassador Satish Chandra uh, is here. He is a former uh, High Commissioner to Pakistan. Uh, the uh, first deputy nsa who set up the national security council secretariat and was involved in the national in the in giving shape to the national security Amen. council uh he is also the vice chairman of the board of trustees of the vivekananda international foundation and uh, he is also involved uh, with the, the vif activities uh, closely uh we also have uh, uh, lieutenant general atha hasnain who knows no introduction uh he was the core commander 15 core and uh, he is a uh, leading commentator uh on uh, matters uh, relating to kashmir and he is a frequent uh, 
uh, commentator on the television as well. He's also been uh, uh, with us, uh, uh, involved in our activities for a long time. Thank you very much for being with us. And I also have uh, today, I can also see many other uh, friends, many senior uh, veterans of the Indian Armed Forces. And I would like to welcome you all to today's day. Uh, General Vijay's book uh, is, uh, I think, uh, some of you may have seen or may not have seen. I'll just show you. Uh, there's an illuminating forward by uh, from Dr. Karan Singh, and I think it's worth reading. He has also uh, give us, given us uh, some interesting insights into Kashmir. Uh, the book will expectedly uh, invite a lot of uh, attention, both uh, within the country and outside. I think uh, contribute to the ongoing debate that uh, we have uh, on the Kashmir affairs. So it's a very uh, important contribution uh, to the debate. It makes a very important contribution to the uh, debate. Uh, I think one very strong point of the book uh, is that uh, it's, I think, one of those few books, early books, which is uh, discussing uh, the the major change that has taken place on the ground following the August uh, uh, 2019 uh, action by the government, by which uh, the Articles 370 and 335A of the Constitution were uh, nullified. And that has radically altered the ground situation. And uh, it has introduced uh, many new elements uh, in the domestic situation, the regional situation, as well as uh, uh, international situation. Uh, both Pakistan and China have been rattled with these changes. And the latter even uh, tried to uh, uh, activate the issue at the UN Security Council by organizing some informal discussions on the issue. Uh, Pakistan, of course, has been uh, quite rattled and uh, they have, uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, has uh, raised the issue at uh, several fora. Uh, the trifurcation of the state has also uh, evoked mixed response in the three regions of the Jammu, of GNK. As could be expected, the decision has been hailed in Jammu and Ladakh while it has caused uh, misgivings uh, in the valley. And uh, sadly, violence and terrorism uh, are uh, returning to the state and we cannot be oblivious to, the, to, the, to that fact. Although there have been uh, very effective steps taken by the government, by the uh, security forces to deal with the situation. Uh, the, at the same time, there is now a, a very sharp and increased focus on uh, developmental uh, issues, which is, I think, a good thing. And uh, uh, there is also now a effort to bring in uh, new politics uh, in uh, uh, the uh, in Jammu and Kashmir uh, by uh, encouraging grassroots politicians to come up and build a constituency of uh, uh, relatively newer and relatively younger uh, stakeholders uh, who see a future for India, a future for Kashmir in. Uh, a tight integration uh, with uh, the country, rest of country. There are no easy solutions uh, to the Kashmir problem, and uh, which has festered uh, since 1947. However, I think uh, August uh, uh, 2019 marks a new beginning, and which indicates, as uh, General Vijay also points out in his book, a clarity of purpose and a proactive approach on the part of the uh, government. Of course, uh, again, the general which points out that the road ahead will not be easy as uh, we see a uh, spike in uh, militancy. And the most, most important, I think, the point that he makes in the book is the uh, very uh, the gathering trend towards Islamic radicalization, uh, which I think is something extremely important. The China Pakistan Economic Corridor, which uh, passes through uh, Gilgit Baltistan. And the Chinese incursions in eastern Ladakh in 2020 have also uh, complicated the domestic and uh, regional uh, environment. So what's the way ahead? And I think book, the book has a strong point there. The author makes a several, he doesn't flinch from any difficult question. And uh, he uh, takes all questions head on 
and he makes a number of uh, very sensible suggestions as to how to uh, deal with uh, the emerging situation. And he also feels that the militancy in Kashmir uh, cannot survive for uh, uh, too long. Uh, but the radicalization of the youth and the you know, calls to set up the Islamic Caliphate is a deeply disturbing uh, development which must be taken uh, uh, note of and dealt with uh, seriously. He also uh, feels that there ought to be sincere dialogue among the three regions of the state and the resources should be divided in fair and uh, just manner. Uh, he also suggests, and this is a very uh, interesting uh, suggestion, he also feels that uh, where there are, uh, uh, where some areas are uh, peaceful, uh, there could be perhaps uh, uh, a withdrawal of the uh, AFSPA, etc. So I think some kind of a, a thinking uh, on those lines uh, is also needed. Uh, and in the long run, it is really the uh, police and the paramilitary forces who should uh, uh, take charge of the internal security. Uh, so there are many uh, other suggestions which I'm sure today we will uh, discuss during the course of uh, uh, today's uh, book discussion. So now I uh, request General Witch to make his uh, initial remarks for maybe about 20, 25 minutes. And then I'll request uh, our, uh, our discussants to make their uh, comments in about 15 minutes each. And then we can uh, have some discussion later. So thank you very much for being with us once again. And once again, thank you, General Witch. Now I hand over the... Uh... Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gupta, for giving me this opportunity to present our book before the very well-informed audience of the VIF. I will also like to thank you for your very kind words and laudatory words while introducing my book. Uh, I'll also like to thank my lot of uh, friends, colleagues, course mates, and others who have joined in this evening for uh, the discussion of this book. I'm sure it will give us many useful and valuable points. Uh, I will also like to convey my gratitude to, to my co-panelists, uh, Ambassador Steve Chandra and Lieutenant General Atta Haslan, who have been a big sport in uh, discussing the way forward in the book also in many ways for our preparation for various presentations. The book was launched on the 23rd uh, by Dr. Karan Singh in a program which was organized by the print media and it will be out on the YouTube on the 28th, that is tomorrow. And then it will remain there for a while. Uh, there was no gathering for that because they didn't want, they wanted only four people to join for that uh, recording. So that much for that. Now, coming on to the subject proper, uh, I'll like to say, as you have already mentioned, Dr. Gupta, that both me and my wife belong to the state. And because of that, we have been able to see the state in varying degrees of turbulence right from the very beginning, though very small in age, in uh, the accession, uh, the uh, the uh, the attack, the Kabyle attack on India on Kashmir area, and thereafter uh, the Shama Prashad Mukherjee agitation, which took place in 1953 in Jammu, in uh, a protest against the new constitution of JNK, which was formed in 51. Thereafter, the 65 and 71 wars, and uh, then it, the story has gone on since then and till today the insurgency is there that's for the last 30 years. And then at the end, I will come on to the security paradigm and talk about that as it exists today in the uh, country and in our neighborhood. Now, coming on to the first thing, uh, I will also like to say that I've tried to compile the book in a manner that uh, it is not a reflection of my childhood impressions because they'll be too premature and they'll be too young age to talk about anything. I have tried to take advantage of my service in the army and my uh, opportunities which I got in various positions to handle the decision making uh, levels. Uh, that is, as you have mentioned already, as the DGMO in the Kargil operations, as the vice chief during our program when the parliament was attacked, 
and then finally as the chief during a very intense period of insurgency. I've tried and kept the book uh, as comprehensive as possible and covered all those points which you have already mentioned. So I will not repeat and avoid repetition on those. Uh, I, but before I get on to the subject proper, I'd like to mention four points which have had a very big bearing on the later outcome of the events in the uh, state. Uh, number one, to start with, the accession instrument which was signed by Dr. Maharaja Hari Singh was the same as was signed by the other princely states. It made very clear that the state is an integral part of India and there's no, the process is irreversible. So that settles that issue. There's no two points about that and no two questions about it. Number two point I like to mention is that Sheikh Abdullah in 1951 May gave a long speech in the Constituent Assembly for almost 50 minutes. And he spoke about the fact that the best option for the Kashmiris was to join the Union of India because India was a democratic country with very wise leaders and Pakistan was not the answer because that was a feudalistic state. And so it would remain, it will not change its style. So that was his uh, first line. Of course, he said that that will be with certain concessions. And what were those concessions? We all know those were Article 370 and Article 35A. Now, but soon after this was done, uh, the constitution changed where Maharaja's post was abolished, Southern Riyasat was brought in, the CM became the PM and they were also given a flag. But the accession part remained unchanged and untouched and that remained that they, are, they have acceded to India wholeheartedly and fully. Now, soon after that, Pandit Nehru in his speeches started saying that this is a temporary and transient measure. And speaking at one place in Hindi, he said that this is arrangement but the intention was very much there that it is not going to be there for good or for permanent. I come on to the next point and that is that this state is a multilingual, multi-ethnic and multi-regional. There are three different communities here, three different, entirely different type of people. There are Dogras here, there are Kashmiri Muslims here and there are also the Ladakhis in this state. All three are totally different. However, the North Muslim part of the state is very unhappy that the Muslims hog the best part of everything, that is education, the economics, the money, everything. And the non-Muslim part do not get a fair deal. And for that reason, the animosity in the state has grown very deep amongst all of them. As a matter of fact, the Ladakhis and uh, Jammu people, that is the Dogras are closer, but with the Kashmiris, they are very, very unhappy on that particular account. My fourth and the last point is that when we were young in the service, and uh, General Sani would, I think, bear me out, we were always told that a stable and a strong Pakistan is in our favor. That will be useful for us. And that's what we learned as young officers. And uh, we kept thinking of Pakistan as a friendly country. Unfortunately, it has not happened because we have moved away from the partition and accepted the partition as a reality. But the Pakistanis have not done that because they feel that the Pakistan they are in, that is more eaten as Jinnah said, because they wanted a Pakistan which was somewhat equivalent to India, which was not possible, really. And this I got to see at first hand when during the Kargil war, I got an opportunity to meet my counterpart uh, Major General Tokiz Dia, who was the DGM of Pakistan Army. And we had a meeting in Thassa towards the end of the Kargil War to coordinate the withdrawal of the terrorists from the area of Kargil and Dras so that they don't take any more casualties than they had taken. During the meeting, I asked General Tokiz Dia, I said, I have brought the photographs of all the 500 people plus who have been killed, around 5 sub 20 odd people who've been killed and we have given them very ceremonial and a proper burial in a proper Islamic manner. And all those have been videographed. Should I give those to you? Will you like to take them home and show it to their parents? And he said, no, no, they are not our people. I don't want those. 
Then I asked him, I said, if that is so, then why are we meeting? What is this meeting in aid of? Because if that be so, then how will you coordinate the withdrawal of the balance of the people? If you do not have any communication with them and you don't know them, to which the, he did not give any answer. However, during the tea break, he took me to one side. He was a very fine gentleman, I must say that. And he was a good cricketer. He became later on the chairman also of the cricket board. And he told me in Urdu, he said, why are you doing this? You have to give me, you also know me. And I will go and show them to their mother. But don't say in the meeting. So that is what showed me that this is a state which will always remain in denial. And they can never change. And one thing more I like to mention in this. At the time in February in 99, in February 99 or 19, Prime Minister Bajpai was in Lahore on his famous bus yatra for having peace with Pakistan. And that was exactly the time when the Pakistanis were moving into Kargil. And that is that much for their honesty and their deceit. So these four points I thought I will mention to you before I get on to the other aspects. I come on to the Siddhik importance of the state. This is a place where there is a confluence of Buddhism and uh, the, China, the Buddhism, the Islamic world, and also the Hinduism. As far as Pakistan is concerned, because POK and um, Baltistan are with them, because of that, they have a direct access to Afghanistan. They have direct access now to China. And of course, India, well, they have an access anyway, but not because of uh, POK and this. And because of that, also, the Gilgit Baltistan, they have a direct access to CPC. And because of CPC, China has a direct access down starting from the Arabian Sea, direct, uh, the Indian Ocean, onto the Gavadar, from the Gavadar post onto the Xinjiang area. So all these people, they stand to gain. They and also think that Afghanistan is their backyard and they are also in close vicinity of the Central Asian republics. Now, I come on to the next point, and that is the 65 and 71 wars. Most of the people feel that India in both the wars lost out on the negotiating table what we won in the wars. And that is perhaps very true because in 65, we gave away the Haji Peel Pass, which was very, very important and very crucial, and which we took a great loss to life. And in 71, and could not take the advantage of that opportunity to convert the line of control into the line of control into uh, international border. Now, there are differing viewpoints on that. One viewpoint is that Indira Gandhi perhaps didn't feel confident to do it because she felt that her cabinet will not accept it. They would also want the area of Gilgit Baltistan and POK along with that. The other party feels, no, we should have accepted that and gone ahead with converting it into international border and not doing so was a great blunder. And so we, in 72, lost out what we had gained in a very big way in the battlefield. Well, these are the different viewpoints. You can pick and choose yours. And uh, now it is a history anyway. Uh, I come on now to the import next important point. That is the 71 war and the birth of Islamic Jihad. 71 war taught Pakistan is one thing, that they could never beat India in a conventional war. And then they realized that the ultimate objective and ultimate aim for them should be to develop a nuclear weapon if they have to compete with India. And even if they have to eat grass as Bhutto proclaimed, ultimately they did so and they have the nuclear weapon systems uh, for quite some time, as a matter of fact, soon after ours. And another point which happened, which was very important, is that both Pakistan and China got even more closer together. And that has given a birth to an evil collision in our immediate uh, neighborhood, and which is a big problem for us. Now, what has also happened, that after the Afghan war was over in 1989-90, Pakistan focused completely towards Kashmir. They had already done training in this particular direction by running the insurgency or the secessionist movement in Punjab with their own help and with the Khalistani help. And they were well trained in this particular type of uh, war and the system 
but Indians were not really prepared for it as much. And three things came to stay as a result of OPTOPAC name which was given to the operation. One was that radicalization was there for all time to stay. That is number one. Number two, the insurgency was there to stay. And third thing, which is very shameful and which is bad, is that there was ethnic cleansing and the fort like Kashmiris had to leave their homes and migrate towards Jammu. And I only hope, and I'll say that once again in the end, I only hope and pray that sometime soon, sooner than later, they will be able to get back to their homes. So that is what was the development as far as the 71 uh, operation was concerned and the follow-up of that and the Afghan war and the follow-up of that. I now come down to the insurgency which carried on from then on to 2019, which is going on. There were many swings, ups and downs, as far as the insurgency was concerned. Many a time down, many a time they were doing well. But I think the Kargil taught them a lesson. And Kargil brought a lot of humiliation and insult to Pakistan, which was the main idea of that operation was that they will unsettle the insurgency grid in JNK and thereby be able to manage and create a control of Kashmir area. Now, but that didn't happen that way. The Indian Army did a good job and we got hold of the area of Kargil once again back with us uh, and completely. And thereafter, now we have developed many communication areas and the approaches to Kargil, so the problem is not there anymore, like what it was during the Kargil time. Now, as far as uh, the insurgency went on till 2016 in various phases. But in 2016, Buranwani appeared on the scene. Now, he was a very dashing personality and a young man. And a lot of youth fell for him. And the insurgency once again picked up in a big way. And there were four de very definitive changes which came about. Number one was that the young people became the commanders. And the commanders were between the age of 14 to 18, 15 to 18. And they called, took a lot of pride in calling themselves as the commanders. Number two, women also joined the insurgency in a big way. The third thing, which became a very common feature at that time, was the street turbulence and the stone pelting. And all that carried on. And the fourth was, there were a lot of attacks on the police stations to snatch weapons. These four things happened and uh, they were quite significant at that time. Few more things happened. On uh, 19th, 18th of September, the Pakistanis launched a surprise attack on Uri. And uh, our, we lost around 16 people. And uh, But India soon recovered the situation when on 29th September, uh, a surgical strike took place all around the line of control at three, four places. And Pakistanis suffered very good losses. And that raised the morale of the uh, country, and it also raised the stock of the country in the international arena. Now, I come down to three other places where also a lot of violence took place. That was Patan Court Airfield, and then Samba, and also the area of Lagrota. Anyway, all three, three places, India uh, fought it as well as they could, and did a good job, and Pakistanis didn't have much of success. Of course, they did surprise us in these three places. And then in 2019, uh, February 14, uh, in Pulwama area, uh, a car loaded with the RDX, which could have only come from Pakistan and nowhere else, hit into a CRPF bus, which was coming back as a part of a convoy from Jammu to Srinagar. And 40 people in that bus, everybody evaporated, they just died. And that crossed the threshold of the patience of India. And India responded very strongly. And on, third, on 26th of February, that's just 12 days after this incident, India went into Balakot, uh, pretty deep inside Pakistan, about 50 kilometers deep inside Pakistan, and hit their training areas. And there were a number of casualties there. A lot of their buildings were destroyed. But more than anything else, it surprised the entire world that India could take an action as strong as that, because it had not happened ever earlier before. And number two, what was very important was that they also understood that this new India 
will not accept any tinkering with their borders and any playing with the integrity of their country. And uh, with that, the government of India also came to one conclusion. And that is one point which I want to come to. And that is a paradigm shift in the history of Kashmir. That in 2019, on 5th of August, the government of India thought it was enough was enough. And there was a time for them to take a very strong action. And they were also convinced that by giving this exclusivity to Pakistan, by exclusivity, I mean the freedom, not to Pakistan, I beg your pardon, to the Kashmiris, uh, three things that happened. They are still thinking that they can be independent. They are still thinking that they can enjoy autonomy. And they are still perhaps in a point that if the need be, they can join Pakistan. None of these were acceptable to us right from the very beginning. And they abrogated Article 370 and Article 35A. And the state was divided into two parts, and Dr. Gupta has already mentioned. One was the area of Kargil and Ladakh, and the second was the area of Jammu and Kashmir. It was a very wise move not to separate Jammu from Kashmir. Perhaps it will get discussed later on in the discussion. So I'll leave it at that, because Jammu is a kind of a glue to hold Pakistan to Kashmir back with India, away from Pakistan, and for many reasons. And uh, the state, the uh, government of India also promised that the statehood will be restored when the situation is ripe and the things have become normal. So that is what uh, was done at that time. And two things more in this correction I like to mention. Once again, I think the government of India had done a very good homework because most of the countries in the world, except for leaving countries like Turkey and Malaysia, uh, every country accepted that this was an internal matter of India and India could do the way they wanted to and settle the issue. Except for China, who raised the issue in the Security Council behind closed doors. And there also it was agreed that it was a bilateral issue between India and Pakistan and they need to settle it by themselves. Next point I'd like to mention about the Kashmiri reaction. There were a lot of views that there will be a mutiny there, there will be there will also views that there will be a mass rebellion there and there will be a huge insurgency movement. Nothing of the sort took place because Kashmiris were so scared and they were so surprised by this sudden action that they were totally taken aback. And they felt that if their leaders could be thrown into the uh, house arrest so easily and also if Pakistan could do nothing except for talk in the international arena, then even Pakistan could do nothing very much for them and was not of much use to them. So because of that reason, even Kashmir remained peaceful and they got busy with managing their life during the pandemic period, which in any case, the rest of the country was also going through. So these were the major uh, developments which uh, took place. I have not talked of the fence because fence will perhaps get talked of later during the question hours. Uh, but it was one thing which we did sometime in the time in 2003 to July 2004 to ensure that the infiltration in JNK was stopped because without that we couldn't have handled this situation. I come on to part two of my talk, and there I will only mention a few points, and I'm not going to elaborate on them because they will be part of the discussion, perhaps. Firstly, I have always been of the opinion, while in service also that we didn't have a national doctrine, we didn't have a policy, we didn't have a set strategy. We kept changing from time to time, by and large. And that was not acceptable and it was needed very badly. I think the time has come and maybe the government is already working. And we must have multi-ministry, multi-agency uh, organization or committees set up to make sure that this particular doctrine and the policy and the strategy is evolved. Yes, one good thing what has happened is, after 5th August 2019 is, that only one agency is handling the Kashmir problem, and that is the Ministry of Home. Earlier, there were a couple of ministries which were fiddling into it, and with the result, there was a bit of a, a confusion, or maybe not as much of a as good a coordination as perhaps it should have been. The next point which i like to mention, very important, is the perception management. As a matter of fact, there is a full chapter in the book on perception management because I thought 
this was one of our weakest areas we could never put across a plausible kashmir story to the kashmiris and it took us a lot of time to convince the world also and as a matter of fact it is a question of a battle of heart and mind and heart and space and this we have to win with the kuriya and the others did very well and they keep dubbing in in the social media day in and day out i think we need to work on this particular in direction very seriously and for that what we need to do is to set up a high powered committee which will have all the agencies in world like the army the police the crpf the bsa whatever whoever is in world and also the academics the uh, all the economists the uh, education is i have already mentioned and also perhaps people from the bollywood or the other who could put across the stories in a manner which will be catching and which will be picked up by the other people with great interest but this needs to be done and this committee must have easy access to the top leadership and also should have no problem with the finances only then we will succeed in this particular direction i want to come to the next point and which is the crib of the kashmiri and which i think uh, we need to really focus on uh, and that is that the people of kashmir are our people we must consider them our people and which we do but some of they are not convinced that we consider them as our people and we are only interested in their geographical trade a terrain mr bajpai made it very clear when he visited kashmir and in one sentence that we will deal with our kashmiri brethren with kashmiri and jamuriyat and insaniyat he won their hearts and minds and even today they remember them i think something of this kind has got to be done at the top leadership level to convince this kashmiri that we love them as much as we love any indian as a matter for us they are as much indians as any other people like us uh, who are there there's hundreds and thousands of their students are in, uh, in the rest of india and they enjoy the same privileges as the rest of the students do the kashmiris can become the citizens of india but an indian couldn't become a citizen of kashmir under the article 356 and article 354 these were the two things so we have given everything to them but some of we have not been able to convince them so we bus work on this particular direction very seriously uh, to handle pakistan i think there is a requirement uh, that we must have pressure points on them and pressure points which are telling which really which going to hurt them in case we really put them to use number one is the indus water treaty which we must tell them and can, that we are serious about it and we will really go back on it should you not mend your ways and secondly even the duran line we will reject it in case you do not follow the things in a proper manner that is very very important a uh, lot of people say that we must talk to pakistan yes we have talked to pakistan any number of times as a matter of fact there have been attempts on peace negotiation peace talk and five major efforts were made starting from ayub khan time going on to the musharraf time and even with nawaz sharif prime minister modi tried but nawaz sharif uh, yesterday i read in the paper that is calling imran khan as stooge of india i do not understand pakistan i thought nawaz sharif was trying to be friendly to prime minister uh, modi anyway the point is very simple that we must uh, tell them that we will talk to you and which we have already told, done so we'll talk to you only if you do not have terrorism in our uh, state and number two that fact that which you keep stating every second day that you yourself are a victim of the terrorism is a bogus argument and we do not accept it and we reject it out of hand the next point now which i must come to is and a very serious matter is a security paradigm in our neighborhood and this is my last but one point uh, in april may 2020 china intruded into number of our territory with almost three divisions worth of troops it took india completely by surprise we thought they had come in for an exercise initially but anyway the, we, our response was exceedingly good we re responded very strongly and the government also gave a free hand to the armed forces and as a result the reactions were very very fast and 
uh, we took them on very well. Uh, then on 30th of August, uh, we captured five features in the Kailash range. And five features were Bagarel, Gurugel, and Rizangla, Richilla, and Mukpari. And all these five gave you a very good look inside the exciting area. And that brought the Chinese on the mother earth. And they started then negotiating with us seriously because they felt that themselves endangered. For them, exciting road is very important. And now there are only two fiction points, and that is the hot springs and the area of Dipsing. Dipsing area is, of course, is a legacy issue. It has gone on for over 10, 12 years. But the point which is very important is that both Pakistan and China together at any time can start a problem for us along the LAC and in the LOC. China can perhaps even extend it to the Eastern sector also. So for that, India needs to remain prepared. And I have always been of the firm opinion, I've been saying it in many discussions in the VIF also, that we must remain prepared for a war in any time to come. It may be useful to them, may not be useful to them, it may not come about. But we can certainly avoid a war if we are prepared for a war. If we are prepared, the Chinese and the Pakistanis will also think 10 times before they started with us because even now they have seen that we did a good job and we stood up very well to them. And they will not like to go to a war without the aim of winning it. And the chances of that for them will be very dim. Number two uh, is the aspect of Afghanistan still being in a lurch about uh, attaining certain amount of uh, uh, sort of a kind of a peace and uh, normalcy in the country. That is not happening. So as a matter of fact, they have had a problem with even Pakistan and they have had exchange of fire. But the general impression was that Pakistanis will use the Afghans very uh, strongly for the purpose of increasing the insurgency level in uh, JNK. But Pakistanis, perhaps that's where their generalship lacks, do not understand that in these many years, three major things have happened. Our intelligence has become very good. Our ecosystem has uh, become is very good. We have wiped out their ecosystem. All their overground workers and other supporters over there have been walked out, and our internal security grid has become very, very strong and very well versed with the area. And we are very well informed of what is happening inside the state. So that is not going to happen. So I think if Pakistan has any such idea, they should change their mind. I uh, guess in the hinterland, I am concerned and I hope that I am totally wrong and completely wrong about it. I do feel that they can create perhaps certain problem because they have a lot of sleeper agents. But if our intelligence is good, which is doing pretty well, and also uh, if we have an internal cohesion, which is good, we will... Uh, which the entire world thinks that Indian internal cohesion is good, then perhaps they will not be able to do very much even there. So that is as far as Afghanistan is concerned. Now I come to the last uh, point of my uh, presentation, ladies and gentlemen, and that is what is the solution. India is a democratic country, and in a democratic country like India, what is very important is that we must have a government which is popular, and it is there. And for that reason, we need to uh, have an election immediately. Prime Minister Modi set the tone for that on 24th of June when we met with all the parties. And he said that Dil se duri or Dil se duri ko dur karna bahut zaruri hai. Laaj bhi hai. All people who attended that meeting uh, took it well. And surprisingly, even Article 370 was not a negotiation killer. Nobody talked of Article 370. And they have not talked of violence to sort of uh, fight Article 370, a restoration of Article 370. Uh, I think that soon after the delimitation is over, which should be in a couple of months, India should go in for an election in JNK. Whether the statehood will be given to JNK before the election or after the election, I cannot say. Really, that is for the government to decide. And they will think of the various pluses and minuses of both and then only decide as to what should happen. 
but the election must be held and a popular government must be installed. I would also like to say here, perhaps the Prime Minister's formula of Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas will do a very good job for India. Insurgency, as a uh, director has also mentioned, is not going to go away in a hurry. Maybe eight, ten years it will take till the back of Pakistan financially is broken. As a matter of fact, I am seeing that people are giving loans to Pakistan in millions of dollars and not billions now because they don't trust them. And no country can survive on this kind of loans. Even Saudi Arabia have, uh, you know, turned their face from them and they are not being very helpful with them. So Pakistan perhaps will be at that time in a state when they will have to stop the insurgency effort. But in the meanwhile, in the next two, three years, I think the insurgency will start crumbling in JNK and perhaps the things will start getting much, much better. But the time which is available to us from now till the time the popular government comes in, I think, and it is my very strong suggestion, that the bureaucracy and the administration improve their performance in the state. Yes, I can understand that the pandemic was a problem and leave behind those formulas and principles which will be accepted, acceptable to all the three communities of the state. That is the, the Dogras and the Muslims and also the Ladakhis. Those formulas must be left behind and they must be formalized so that when the next government comes, it's not easy for them to change and go back to the old ways. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, the litmus test for the patient and rather the, uh, I think the peace in JNK would be when the Kashmiris will return to their uh, house, homes uh, peacefully and settle down once again. We, let's hope and pray that that time will come soon. Eight, ten years is not very long in the history of a nation. And I don't think uh, that that time will be very long. And perhaps we will be able to manage it in that. With you got muted, sir. You got muted. These people, uh, 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 print people, Atta made a mention that he will think that uh, the peace has returned when they will meet uh, us, the soldiers, and a Kashmiri will say Jain, like the people in Arunachal do. But I must tell you a story. Uh, when I was in the NDMA in 2005, there was an earthquake. We had gone to Tandar area, and there was a lot of damage there. And there the Kashmiris were saying Jain to us because they wanted the money to be given to them by the army and not by the civil administration. And money means the, the money which was being allotted by the government. And we were so delighted and happy on that, that I wrote a letter to my successor, General J.J. saying that, look, what I never heard in my entire life, and which I never thought that I will hear. I have heard it today. I hope it will happen with you also. I don't know. I don't think it would have happened with him. But I surely agree with that, uh, that if they start saying Jai to us, that will be perhaps another litmus test. Well, thank you very much once again. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, General Rich, for those uh, uh, that introduction uh, to your book. And now I request uh, our panelists to uh, make their uh, remarks. And I start with uh, Ambassador Siti Chandra. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Arvind. Am I audible? Yes, we can. Uh, am hear I you. audible? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I feel uh, privileged to be here as a panelist for the book review, Kashmir Conundrum. Um, it's, it's a delight to be on this panel because uh, there are so many distinguished people here. And above all, the book is an excellent work. It is a must read for anyone who wishes to know more about Kashmir in all its aspects. Uh, it is such a good work because General Bridge is not only has the intuitive insights of an insider, but also because he has a hands-on expertise as uh, one of our 
leading lights in the armed forces. So therefore it has this dual uh, aspect to it, which makes it an ex extremely good book. Um, as the director had mentioned earlier, General Wedge has been intimately involved with Kashmir and in fact, was the person uh, primarily responsible for pushing through the smart fence, which has led over the years to a reduction in infiltration. One of the important features of this book is that it is a truly comprehensive work. Many books have been written on Kashmir, but they deal with some aspects, leaving out others. And I think the effort which has been successful is to make this an holistic work. It deals with military aspects as well as, as other areas uh, also. And in fact, he has missed out very little in this book. Uh, he details the state's geographic, linguistic, religious, etc. characteristics. It's age-old Indian connect, the Kashmiri character with all its complexities, and I'll refer to that a little bit later. The nature of Kashmiria, its strategic importance, its invasion by Pakistan and subsequent accession to India, its constitutional relationship with India, the confabulations pertaining to it in the UN. In fact, he has dealt with that in considerable detail, as also the various peace initiatives and negotiations on Kashmir between India and Pakistan. Uh, he has also dealt with the military confrontations between India and Pakistan, the ups and downs of the insurgencies which were instigated by Pakistan and Kashmir, and the Indian reaction thereto, as well as the modification of Article 370, which has brought about a paradigm shift, putting the seal on Kashmir's accession to India. In fact, it's a totally up-to-date book. And uh, as I was discussing with General Bidge, it went through several revisions because events kept happening and the book was constantly updated. So it's ab absolutely fresh now and you can read it and you will be up-to-date on Kashmir. On the Kashmiri mindset, uh, uh, it's interesting. He quotes what Mr. Brijesh Mishra mentioned to Mr. Dulat that the only oh, thing straight in Kashmir is the poplar tree. That's all that's straight in Kashmir. And uh, in fact, this parallels what others have written about it also about the Kashmiri character. And uh, the most notable that comes to mind is that by Mr. Jagmohan in the frozen turbulence, which he wrote, which is a massive uh, over 1000 page book in which he says that Sheikh Abdullah was a communalist in Srinagar, a communist in Jammu and a nationalist in Delhi. And in very much a similar way later on, Jagmohan goes on to say that most Kashmiri politicians are adept at speaking with two voices. They could be secular as well as communal, democratic or dictatorial, accessionist as well as pro park Underlying motivation was not is not principles, but power. And I think this is what the author also captures when he is speaking about Kashmir, about, about the Kashmiri mindset. Most of uh, the assessments in the book uh, are perceptive. They are based on impeccable logic. And I'd like to run through a few of these. I agree with most of them. There are a couple I don't agree with, which I'll come to. But the ones that I think are spot on, Accession of Jammu and Kashmir to India is legally and constitutionally complete. Taking the Kashmir issue to the UN Security Council and accepting a ceasefire were major, and I quote, blunders. 
a plebiscite in Jammu and Kashmir, as proposed by the UN, was impossible, as Pakistan refused to fulfill the condition of vocation of aggression. Kashmir is only a symptom of India-Pakistan differences arising from Pakistan's desire to break up India and its quest for parity. Both the 1965 and 71 conflicts were, quotes, disasters for Pakistan. India missed, again, quotes, a golden opportunity to settle the Kashmir issue for good at Simla. And this, again, General Vij has just said in his remarks, but it bears repetition. Sensitized by the 71 conflict to the fact that it could not defeat India in a conventional war, Pakistan evolved a three-pronged strategy against India, involving nuclear weaponization, proxy war, and radicalization of the values. I could add a fourth to this, and this has been a constant in Pakistan foreign policy, and we have seen it playing out over the decades, that they have tried to get a foreign partner to balance India. It used to be the USA, it is today China, but it has also the organization of uh, Islamic states, etc., with which it, it does this, and it used this as a foreign element. Vigorous anti-terrorism measures have led to an improved security situation in India. And in fact, as General Bij has stated, he sees this crumbling in the months and years to come. Again, he stated this, India has never had a well-defined and consistent national strategy to address Pakistan-sponsored terrorism. Next, India's retaliation against the Pulwama terror attack by way of the Balak court strikes surprised everyone. It constituted a new response paradigm with India, exercising the right to retaliate as deemed appropriate by it, even if this entailed crossing the border or using air power. So here, he mentions that India, this, this shift is extremely significant because it means that today India will decide when, where, and how it will retaliate against this, which hitherto, even at the time of Kargil, we did not cross the ROC. So here is a clear differentiation that has come about. The next point that he makes is that Pakistan is unlikely to desist from its proxy war against India, as it is determined to grab Kashmir. And then he comes on to the, today, Article 370. This was a temporary arrangement, and having outlived its purpose, its abrogation was timely and a decisive step, ending all certain, uh, uncertainties. Since he has spoken about Pakistan and its duplicity, and I've spent half my life uh, dealing with Pakistan in one capacity or another. This duplicity to diplomats who have dealt with Pakistan for uh, the best part of their careers, it's really common knowledge, it's nothing new. And in fact, many of us felt that the outreach to Pakistan is really quite meaningless because they have determined that India is their enemy and they need that enemy. And this point is brought out very clearly in B.K. Nehru's uh, book, Good Guys Finished finish Last or something like that, in which he has stated that this is way back in 47. He had gone to Pakistan, to Karachi for negotiations. And uh, the negotiations were on economic issues. These negotiations were successful. But every morning, Dawn had a nasty uh, pieces and articles on India. And he protested to the cabinet secretary over drinks. They were all good friends. They were all ICS officers. And they knew each other for, for, for decades. And he told him, he said, you know, what's all this nonsense every day? So he said, you know, over a scotch. He said that, listen, don't get worried. We need an enemy. 
India is there, there's no better enemy for us than India because we needed to hold the country together. So BK Nairo followed up with the question, how long will this last? So he said, oh, five, six years. And BK Nehru wrote this book in 1997 or thereabouts. And he said, you know, this still continues. But today, there is the Pakistan army has a vested interest in an inimical relationship with India because that is the only way in which it can get to govern Pakistan. If India as an enemy disappears, there is no reason why the army should not go back to the barracks. That is the reason why they want it and what the army has done. Even if the army should disappear suddenly, what they have done is they have brainwashed an entire generation of people with such propaganda against India. And if you read the Pakistani Urdu press particularly, you'll come to realize how much hatred there is for India. So I think we need to recognize this. And I can say this because we are all amongst friends that the NSCS certainly in uh, 2001 and thereabouts advised against this dialogue processing and of Musharraf being invited to India and so on and so forth. Because the point is, you cannot have friendship with Pakistan. And that's why the other conclusion, which I'll come to, which General Ridge has mentioned, that you need to penalize Pakistan. We have never done it. I go even beyond that, but I'm sticking to General Ridge's book. The penalization is essential because unless you do that, you are not going to get any love from Pakistan. Now, I would like to come on to one or two other points that have been made in terms of uh, the assessments that are there. And I disagree with two of these, and I've discussed these with the General Vij on an earlier discussion. One is that it is stated that Simla can be taken, and this is at page 84 of the book, Simla can be taken both as a success and a failure. Now, in my view, at least, it was an unmitigated failure. You had everything. And incidentally, I may say, for the record, that, and it's stated in one place correctly and one place incorrectly in the book, that the POWs were released as a result of Simla. No, that was not the case. There was a separate agreement on the POWs. The major, the main giveaway at Simla was the territory that we were sitting on. It was five or 6,000 square miles of territory. We were sitting on that territory and that we conceded. Now that concession should never have been made by us without settling the Kashmir issue. And there are reports that, uh, and I can believe this, that Bhutto, you know, said, Aap bade bhai hai, et cetera, et cetera, all that sort of thing, your elders, et cetera, Rest assured, I'll settle it. And, and we fell for that. We keep falling for these things. But I can tell you that the group that was in uh, Simla at the time of this agreement, I'm talking of the diplomats uh, from the level of Joint Secretary downwards, who was then Deputy High Commissioner in Pakistan, because I was in Pakistan also till the conflict. And uh, he and the deputy secretary then concerned Mr. Bakshi. And in fact, he's written about this in a journal that they knew what Bhutto was all about, that he was a nasty piece of unreliable works and that he should never be trusted. But yet Mrs. Gandhi's advisors, I think, failed and they trusted Bhutto that the settlement would be of the of the um, uh, LOC would be transformed into an international boundary. Now, the point has been made by others that, uh, you know, Mrs. Gandhi was worried about her cabinet. I think anyone who knows Mrs. Gandhi didn't care, I, I'm not going to use the nasty word, didn't care anything very much about the cabinet. She was determined that this LOC would become the international border between India and Pakistan. And this POK business is now, uh, you know, that she would be taken apart by our cabinet is now sort of an excuse that is being trotted out by people uh, who are also colleagues of mine 
from the foreign service that you know she was worried about all this this is incorrect she wanted it settled bhutto said i am not going to you know i will do it but in time i'll be you know killed in pakistan if i go and settle so as far as mrs gandhi is concerned she was in control of her house bhutto maybe maybe was not but we should have allowed him to stew in his own juice if he did not settle it and that's why i think Simla was a terrible mistake. By this. The second one is that uh, point has been made. This is at page two hundred and thirteen. That Article three seventy served its purpose at the time, as it was necessary to secure Sheikh Abdullah's support for Kashmir's accession to India. Now, Kashmir, by the time Article three seventy was brought in, Kashmir had already acceded to India. This had been done and dusted on the 26th of october 1947 the article 370 was introduced much later as a part of our constitution now sheikh abdullah what he said or didn't say didn't matter the deed was done so why do you want to satisfy it and i would like to add to this what actually has been brought out in another very good book which is called looking back by meherchand mahajan who was the prime minister of uh, jammu and kashmir before the accession and he has brought this out very clearly in his book that there was no love lost between pakistan and sheikh abdullah or between jinnah and sheikh abdullah and india's own we weren't dying to grab kashmir or get kashmir to accede to india he has written India accepted accession reluctantly and with great hesitation. We weren't keen on it. In fact, uh, Mount Patton and others had told Hari Singh that you know why don't you sort it out with Pakistan and settle there. So India was not very hot on Kashmir, and this justification for three seventy, I, I I at least find it difficult to accept. The book is uh, contains. Has has got a lovely piece in it, which is the best I've seen anywhere, and it's worth reading. A telling comparison between the areas of Jammu and Kashmir, which are with India, and those under Pakistan's illegal occupation, which conclusively demonstrates that the areas with us go handsomely over the latter, both. in terms of the enjoyment of civil and political rights and in terms of economic development and well being it's a it's a beautifully done piece and i think will be instructive for a lot of people the book is extremely rich in recommendations and uh, i think hats off to general bage for pressing the point that pakistan needs to be penalized and he has uh, said some things which most others are hesitant to say but i'm glad he is done it being the bold man that he is uh, that's that's how he would do it and the things that he has said is that we should consider walking away from the indus water treaty in fact this was a recommendation in a different form which was made by us also from nscs uh, early two decades ago also that we should not accept the durand line and that would be a very major pressure point on pakistan and also at an appropriate time would help in stabilizing our links with afghanistan when uh, we find it appropriate to do so there is however even this uh, recommendations another area where i have a different view which is a, a long standing difference that i have had with general bitch for some years now where he has suggested that we revisit our nuclear doctrine and consider making tactical nukes now uh, i find that the existing doctrine fully meets our requirements and tactical nuclear weapons are therefore redundant in any case the management of tactical nuclear weapons is a whole new game which we would have to get into which would uh, not only uh, diminish the fissile material which we would require for making uh, the real nukes rather than 
the strategic, uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, the long range uh, nukes, et cetera, that we want, uh, even going into very higher tonnages. And it is also going to enormously increase costs in your uh, 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 con uh, command and control systems. So I, I feel it is unnecessary. I'd much rather use our fissile material to make uh, nuclear weapons which could threaten both our neighbors with which we have to deal with. And we would need enormous quantities of fissile material over the years to come. Uh, I think the most important single recommendation, there are many and I will not comment, there are others who are better than me who can comment on that. But I think the, if I was to pick one very major recommendation, which is uh, extremely perceptive and essential, is the creation of a dedicated organization for perception management. This is not only necessary for Kashmir. It is really the whole of India's story that we must send the world home. And for that, perception management is essential. I do think that we are falling behind on that. And that is a, a very major problem that we have on anything that we do. We are unable to sell our story because we have not created systems to do so. And in today's complex work, you need systems. Such an entity uh, addressing and operating through not only traditional media, but also the internet and various social, social, social media platforms is a pressing requirement. And these are being used today in Kashmir, in the Kashmir context, not only for creating an anti-India narrative, but also for radicalizing youth. And uh, the author has brought out very uh, clearly the tremendous dangers that are emanating from this radicalization. And he's built at length on this. So this sort of an organization is, I think, uh, critical for India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for those uh, remarks and also some uh, additional insights that you have provided arising out of uh, your long experience of dealing with uh, uh, Pakistan. So we'll come to those uh, during the Q&A. But now let me request uh, General uh, Atah Hasnan to kindly make some remarks. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Thank you and Jayand, everyone. That's the book. That's the book we are talking about. I think it was not shown so far, so at least we can just show you that this is the book we are talking about. It's an amazing, it's an amazing book. One has seen a lot of books on Jammu and Kashmir, on the Kashmir issue, uh, on the regional aspects of South Asia, but uh, a, a book which is going to be treated as a textbook in the years to come, I think, to my mind, uh, is this book. It is very, very easy to understand. And I'm not talking about the luminaries who are here attending this event. For you, understanding is an obvious thing. You already know everything. It's a question of the rank and file of India. Is the youth of India. Is the uninformed people in India. They are the ones who have to be informed about it. You want informed opinion outside. And I think this book, the greatest achievement that this book has, has had is that it is the simplest of language, the simplest of narratives. And it is not in a biographical form at all. It's uh, written in a different style. As a result, the word I does not come anywhere. And that is my complaint against General Rich, that uh, in his traditional way, he takes no credit for anything at all. And that's why it's left to people like me and us to give him that credit. And I may start uh, my 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Let me start by saying 2003 to 2005, what was achieved in his time, leave out Jammu and Kashmir, leave out JNK, what was achieved in his time, perhaps was not achieved in a long time. The coming of uh, Headquarters Southwestern Command, the bifurcation of 16 Corps and the creation of Headquarters 9 Corps, the coming of ECHS, the coming of uh, Married Accommodation Project, MAP, all this happened in two years and two months. 
Very rarely did we ever find so many achievements coming together. And then the icing on the cake, which was the LC fence, the LOC fence. And let me spend a little time on this because this is the thing which is the closest to my heart when it comes to my relationship with General Rich. Uh, let me say very clearly that 2001, he was uh, still the DGMO about to go as the Army Commander. Southern Command came back as the Vice Chief. 2001 was a very important year in the history of Jammu and Kashmir. That's the year when we had the highest number of terrorists killed. 2,100 terrorists died that year. But I just not wish you to recall that whenever we killed 13, 14, 1500, 2000 terrorists, we always had 2,500 or 3,000 infiltrating inside. And at the end of the year, always the figure seemed to be in, to the advantage of Pakistan, the deep state, the terrorists, the separatists. The first man who perhaps realized this in terms of the mathematics of terror was General Lynch, who said the, the answer lies in reducing infiltration. How do we how do we bring down infiltration? Can we bring the strength of terrorists down in the Kashmir Valley or in the whole of JNK to below 1,000? I still remember his terminologies, sub 1,000. That's what he said to us. And uh, I don't know where he got this idea from. I've spoken to him extensively. He has related it sometimes with the idea of being able to construct a, a fence of, for 750 kilometers at obnoxious heights of going up to 12, 13,000 feet. The idea could never have struck me, for example. I, it could never have struck. The idea was good enough, no doubt. Ideas many of us have is a question of execution. And I happened to be the commander of the Uri Brigade at that time. And I know that I constructed 108 kilometers out of this. And only I know how it was constructed. Uh, even I, as a commander there, said it is impossible. It cannot happen. And General Witt said everything is possible. It will happen. And we made it happen. So if by 2007, the strength of terrorists had come down to 650, it's because the AIOS, the anti-infiltration obstacle system, had been set up. And confidence had been reposed in it by the rank and file of the Indian Army. The entire 1516 Corps were completely confident that they could now hold back the infiltration. I thought this is very important for people to know because this is a really a great achievement of his, which he doesn't own up to at all uh, when it comes to writing out the narrative. I'll take a cue from where Ambassador Satish Chandra left off on a very important issue, uh, that of perception management. And the whole issue of the this, uh, uh, this uh, suggestion which has which given of having a committee or a set of committees, etc. Now let me start by saying it's surprising, first of all, that General Bridge has uh, said that uh, our perception management and outreach has not been good enough. I we all in the Indian Army thought that we were doing a superb job in Sadhvavna, Sadhvavna for 24 years now. We, we, everyone who comes away from Kashmir says, oh, what a marvelous job the army is doing on Sadhbhavna. You know, we have these tours and we have got these schools, 43 Goodwill schools running and all things like that. But at the end of the day, when you analyze it deeply, you realize all that is happening with Sadhbhavna is sub-tactical achievement. It is sub-tactical. It is good military civic action. It is leading to good relationship between company commanders and the local gentry and maximum battalion commanders and the local people. To put this entire thing together and bring it to a strategic level has had never been done, has still not been done. We are still tactical and sub-tactical in our thinking of outreach and perception management. To the extent that when we hold a function on perception management, we and or release a book on perception management, we put up a huge holding and say perception management. I mean, that is the kind of an idea we have that to send the idea of perception management to the people we are managing, we must put in the background perception management. Right. So, to my mind, this has been so unscientifically done. Sadhbhavana, marvelous achievement we have done tactically. But how to get this to the, to the, to the strategic level is what General which suggests here, Sadhbhavana at the national level. Sadhbhavana with ownership of the government of India, not the Indian Army alone. For oh, far too long has the Indian Army been left to do what it wants to do or what it thinks it can do. It's done such a marvelous job, but that is what all that it can do. It needs the government of India's ownership to do something more. 
And for that, unless you have the understanding of the cultural milieu, and then unless you have the understanding of the cultural tradition, the faith, value system, sentiments, and, and, and uh, the sensitivities of the people, you cannot make a dent. This is an essential thing. John Patriot civilized it in Afghanistan very late. Nine years later, when in 2010 he became the commander, he realized there that he was going wrong, that the Americans had made no strategic efforts at all to go do an outreach to the people of, of Afghanistan. Perhaps we made the same mistake to some extent. Let me quote anecdotally, let me quote very, 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 in very simple terms and in very few words. I can see John Deepak Kapoor is here. And it's so nice to see John Deepak Kapoor, sir. And I relate an anecdote related to you only, sir. That you came to my headquarters in, in Baramula, and I was relating to you in my briefing. And I told you, sir, one of the things we are doing <coughs> is we are reaching out to the local clergy in Baramula to understand some of the sensitivities of the people around. What are the religious sensitivities? How do we, how can we get, get over them, get past them? And we've had one or two meetings like this. We have, you know, we've got them over, we've given them a meal, we've given them gifts, and they've spoken their heart to us. Now, I remember John Deepak Kapoor complimenting me. I said, that's the way forward. Understand the culture, understand the sensitivities of the people. Outside in the tea break, when we came outside, my pants were taken off by others, not by John Deepak Kapoor, by lots of others, senior, senior to me, who said, what the hell, you, you are dealing with religion? Religion has no business, the army has no business to be dealing with religion. So you see, if you don't understand, if you, if you think that your hands are only restricted and you're only going to deal with tactical operations, then you're going to be left doing that. I said, absolutely, that's the, well, when there were orders in the Indian army, I can do nothing about it. And I, and I stopped, I stopped that day. When I came back as Josie 15 Corps, I pursued it in a different way. So I just want to tell you that this has been a shortcoming with us. Where the intellectual capital, the ability to do this kind of an outreach to an intellectual capacity has just not been exploited. As a result, this is exactly what you need to do at the national level, which is what you, which has suggested that you need people from different walks of life in a major committee. If you can have an NDMA, if you can have a, a university grants commission, you can also have a communication strategy organization, which is just an authority. It should have membership from all walks of life. And these are the people who should be studying all this and recommending things to the government of India. And through that, the outreach to the people of Jammu and Kashmir must, must continue. I've taken a lot of time. Let me just make two or three very quick points. General Witt in his book gives out lots of cues to think about. He speaks about ASPA, for example. If you see in the later part of his book, the ASPA is covered in fair detail. Now, ASPA is under fire in Northeast, you see at the moment. And at one place, General Vid mentions that perhaps ASPA in Jammu and Kashmir could also be uh, reviewed. And uh, some of the districts like Samba, Katua, or uh, other districts in, in Kashmir where the activities are not too high, can be, it can be removed. This is exactly what uh, Omar Abdullah had also recommended at one time in 2010-11. And we, we went hammer and tongs after him to object to his thing. Today, uh, I'm seeing a lot of reason in what uh, General Vij is saying. I'm seeing a lot of reason. After seeing what has happened recently in the Northeast, uh, perhaps the time has come for us not to completely do away with us. You need empowerment and you need protection. Two very important aspects of uh, counterinsurgency, counterterrorist counter operations. You need empowerment of the army and you need the protection of the soldier. Can we find a why are media of doing this? I strongly feel we need a review of ASPA. We need a reenactment of ASPA. The language of ASPA is too harsh. It's not the language of 2021. It is the language of 1958 and it's the language of 1990 when human rights was not a concern in the world. Today, human rights is a concern in the world and India cannot be diplomatically isolated on the issue of human rights of all things. So I tend to agree with your which completely, this is an aspect we need to pursue and pursue it deeply in some way or the other. My second point is about uh, what's happening in Punjab. And yesterday only I wrote an article in the Chanakya Forum, one of the, one of the online portals, to say that um, eyes are off Punjab, it seems. 
somewhere down the line, it seems Pakistan got very emboldened by what was happening in Ladakh. And it seems that uh, Pakistan feels much more wanted by China today to two front wars, the dual front thing, threats. And after what's happened in Afghanistan, its confidence seems to have gone up. And it seems to think, unlike 1989, 1991, when it withdrew its uh, hand from Punjab and came into Jammu and Kashmir in a bigger way, I think this time he's confident that he can handle both. He can handle JNK and he can handle uh, Punjab. And it need not be the classic terrorism way. It can be hybrid war of a different kind. Hybrid wars can be so many different kinds of hybrid wars. The kind that the Russians are pursuing today in Ukraine, for example. And in this, social media will play a huge role. Cyber will play a huge role. Finance will play a huge role. These are the kind of things that the Pakistanis are probably looking at in the future. And therefore, to think that, uh, even to my mind, eight to 10 years is, uh, uh, to look at potential peace in eight to 10 years and JNK is something near impossible. I'm looking at it in a much further time frame. This was the chart time frame in which we are going to find things changing again, coming back, coming back in a very negative way against us. Because what is happening is the American, the American focus on the Middle East, the American focus on Afghanistan, Central Asia is shifting. And you're going to find the forces of Islam, negative forces of Islam from the West, all probably coagulating together and coming against, coming against us this side, in this direction, towards us. And this is what Pakistan is going to take advantage of uh, in, the, in the near future. My last one point, perhaps. Uh, we are talking of delimitation, General uh, which talks a lot about delimitation also in, this, in the book. I don't know at the end of the day, because it's a very current subject at the moment, at the end of the day, is delimitation with 43 seats and 47 seats going to make any difference? To my mind, at the end of the day, you're still going to come back with the National Conference government. And uh, after all this rigmarole that we have gone through to get back an NC con government in power, how are we ultimately going to pursue this? What is the center and state relationship going to be uh, once Jammu and Kashmir is restored to the status uh, of, of a state? There are very interesting cues which General Bridges book actually gives to us to keep thinking about. And my absolutely the last point is on the Jammu, I would call it the Jammu conundrum. You see, the Kashmir conundrum is one part, there's a Jammu conundrum also here. Because Jammu is very unhappy with what happened. They wanted a trifurcation. And John, very, I agree with him entirely that you couldn't trifurcate. You had to bifurcate. If anyone knows Jammu and Kashmir, and everyone here knows that, there is such an intrinsic link between Jammu and Srinagar, or Jammu and Kashmir, and interdependency, not just business, not just cultural, and emotive in the interdependency. Ultimately, if a solution has to come for Kashmir, it will come through the Jammu. I'm convinced about that. You can't detach Jammu from Kashmir at all. The more we do, I always used to tell my commanders, we keep sending out tours from Kashmir all over India, to Mysore, to Bangalore, to Mumbai and Jaipur. I said, we hardly send a tour from Kashmir to Jammu. We need to, we need to send people from here to understand the other side of the Pir Panjab. Because most people in Kashmir haven't gone that side and had a look. People from Jammu haven't come this side. We need much more interaction between two sides of the Peel Panjal. If we do this, this intrinsic conflict situation which has emerged today due to a lack of understanding completely, we can, we can get hold of it, we can take control of it. And that will lead to a tremendous degree of peace in both Jammu and Kashmir. I could go on and on, but I'm so sorry that I've taken so much of your time. I will only say at the end, the bottom line is, we have to look at this just the way General Wedge has done it comprehensively, politically, militarily, economically, socially, and psychologically. The psychological domain is so, so important in this entire thing. We have to have a strategy in place. We cannot look at conflict termination as yet. Nowhere near it. We are later stages of conflict stabilization. We can go towards conflict transformation after this, and that's about all. Diplomatically, we need to do much, much more. The Indian narrative is not even spoken about in the important capitals of the world. And I can vouch for that. Thank you very much, sir. Jai.
Thank you. Thank you, General Hasnain, for uh, those very substantive points which arise out of the book. And I think that is the hallmark of a good book. Uh, we have already started discussing some of the very important uh, issues. So we have now uh, about half an hour for uh, our discussion. We'll finish at seven. And uh, I would request uh, people to make their comments either in the chat box or draw my attention and I will uh, uh, call you out. So the floor is now open for discussion. Yes, I think uh, that's uh, Vijay Granthi ji. Yes, uh, Vijay, please go. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. And it was really enlightening uh, uh, look at a wonderful book, which I have yet to read. Uh, the main issue, I'm a journalist and uh, I know Indian government and Indian Army security